Okay, welcome back. Uh, we have two additional cases to hear this afternoon. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Collier. Good afternoon, Judge Murphy. Um, the first case is in the matter of Bruce Morrow. Um, you each have 20 minutes. Uh, Mr. Collier, you may attempt to um, reserve some of that, but we'd like you to try and take, uh, take control of that yourself. And with that, you may begin. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, and may it please the court. My name is Trent Collier, and I represent Judge Bruce Morrow. Um, I intend to reserve five minutes if I can. The Judicial Tenure Commission, or JTC, issued the complaint that is at issue here. Subsequently, the JTC issued the findings of fact and conclusions of law on its own complaint, and that is now before the court. This process violates Judge Morrow's due process rights under the federal consti constitution. And as the Supreme Court, as the US Supreme Court has held, this violation of the due process clause is so grave that it cannot be cured. It's not subject to harmless error review. Now there's no doubt that the JTC itself is responsible for the complaint at issue here because that's exactly what court rule 9.224 says. And there's no doubt that the JTC issued a dis decision and recommendation about its own complaint, because that's exactly what court rule 9.44 says. Um, in fact, that rule tasked the JTC with three things. It has to issue findings of fact, it has to make conclusions of law, and then it has to make a recommendation as to discipline. 20 years ago in Cherzanowski, this court said that that process was okay under the due process clause. It relied primarily on a case from the US Supreme Court called Withrow versus Larkin. Two critical things have changed since that time. In 2009, the US Supreme Court issued its opinion in Caperton, which holds that there can be such an Ob objective potential for bias that it violates the due process clause. And then in 2016, the U US Supreme Court issued Williams versus Pensil Pennsylvania. And that court held that when you had a judge who previously part participated in the same case as a prosecutor, even though it was an extremely minor role, that combination of roles was so uh, raised such a risk of bias that it violates the due process clause. So there's now a, a spectrum. On one end, you have Withrow and Larkin. That case holds that as, if you have a body combining investigation and judging, that's fine. But on the other end of this, spectrum, which the court didn't have 20 years ago in Cherzanowski, is Williams versus Pennsylvania, which holds that as investigation becomes something more like prosecution, that implicates the, the, the due process clause. And I would note that this is not, a, not a, a way of reading these cases that we've made up. Wright and Miller, which is the federal practice treatise, um, explains exactly what I've just said. You have these two cases, these two poles, and the JTC as it's set up under the Michigan court rules is on one end of those poles. It combines prosecution and judging and that violates the due process clause. The JTC has tried to get out from under this case law in a, in a few ways. First, the JTC tells the courts that Williams only applies to criminal cases. That's not true. And we know it's not true because w Williams itself was not a criminal case. It was a post-conviction proceeding, the fifth one. And as a matter of law, that is a civil case. So it's absolutely not true that this is a rule that only applies to criminal proceedings. Mr. Collier, let me, let me interrupt you to make sure that um, we get to the questions my colleagues have. And then if there's additional time, you can return to your okay. presentation. Um, and I will start with Justice Kavanaugh. Uh, I don't have any questions right now. 
Justice Welch. No questions right now. Um, Justice Zara. No questions at this time, thank you. Justice Viviano. I don't have any questions either, although I did want to just comment, Mr. Collier, I appreciate you taking some time to focus your arguments on the process, because I don't think we get enough of that. So I appreciate that, but I don't have any questions at this time. Justice Bernstein. Hello, oh, good afternoon. Welcome to the court. Uh, just a question about correlation of the penalty versus the findings. If you could kind of address, I know I'm kind of jumping right to the uh, penalty issue, but would you the sanction that was that was that was offered or or uh, put forth? What are your comments as it pertains to that? <clears throat> that sanction is grossly out of step with this court's precedent. I, I, I you know, I, one of the most recent cases where the court dealt with these types of issues was the uh, Corsica case, and in that case, you had a judge on the bench telling a child that they were gonna to have to go to the bathroom in public. That is the most vulnerable thing that most kids can think of. And this court held in that case that that judge was only subject to public censure. In this case, you have Judge Morrow talking to grownups and essentially having, according to the JTC, the same type of issue. And so I, I think it is dramatically out of step for the JTC to argue for 12, 12 months here. Thank you, Council. Justice Clement. No questions at this time. Okay, you may continue, Mr. Collier. If it's okay with you, I'll just open it up. And if people want to interrupt you with questions, uh, we'll do that. <clears throat> yeah, that that would be that would be great. Um, so, so the next thing that the JTC says to try to get under this out of this body of case law is that the, is that it really only makes a recommendation. That's not true. MCR 9.244 expressly tasks the JTC which with making findings of fact and conclusions of law. In fact, this court has even said that it gives deference to the JTC's findings of fact. So we have a process in which the JTC issues a complaint, the JTC rules on its own complaint, and then this court defers to the JTC's findings. I, I think that is a clear violation of the due process clause as set forth in Williams. Um, next, the, the JTC says, well, this conflict doesn't matter because this court has final say. If that were true, then there would be no problem with biased trial court judges because the Court of Appeals can always hear their cases and overrule them. And that's not the rule for trial court judges. More importantly, that argument that bias only counts if it matters to the actual disposition of the case is contrary to what the US Supreme Court held in Williams versus Pennsylvania. The court held there that the error was so grave that it doesn't matter whether the judge cast the key vote. The fact that a, that, that a judge with that much risk for bias was involved in the process invalidated the whole process. Um, finally, uh, the JTC argues that there is a case from the o Oregon Supreme Court that deals with the same arguments that we're raising here and rejected them. That is not true. You read the case that the JTC cites, you will see the issue in that case was that a judge acting as a judge issued a dissent and then the same case came back to his court and then the party argued because of his actions as a judge in that case, he shouldn't hear the case when it came back to the court. That's obviously not the rule, no court follows that rule. And that's not the issue we have here. The issue here is the JTC is prosecutor and then judge. Um, now, I wanna be clear that there is no doubt that those appointed to the JTC are honest, faithful public servants, but they are human. And what the US Su Supreme Court recognized in w Williams versus Pennsylvania is that we tend to see evidence through the lenses of the views that we formed in the past. And because we have the court rule that requires the JT to form views about the case, 
it's going to view all of the evidence to try to confirm the view it formed at the outset of the, of the case. Fortunately, there is an easy fix. The Michigan Constitution only requires uh, that the JTC issue a recommendation. This issue about the JTC issuing a complaint and then making findings of fact and conclusions of law about its own complaint arises only because of the court rules. So all the court has to do to fix this problem in the court rules is make the JTC have the same kind of structure as the bodies that are in charge of attorney discipline, meaning you have a, a separate body that decides whether to pursue claims and the JTC itself stays out of that process so it won't be biased when the case comes bef before the JTC. Uh, this is not this issue of bias is not an abs not an abstract issue. We cited six cases over the past twenty years in which the JTC has issued a complaint, and then it the case went before a neutral judge who heard the evidence, who was able to look people in the eye, and that judge decided that some or all of the claims were not proven. Then when it went back to the JTC. The JTC stuck with its guns and, and, and overruled the master. And even though it was the master and not the JTC who actually saw testimony. And I, I think that bias is clear in this case too. If the court looks at how the JTC has handled case law like Hawking, and that was a case where a judge on the bench essentially justified sexual violence. This judge said that because a woman allowed a man to, to come over to a place at night, that man was entitled or reasonable to presume that she wanted to have sex with him. That's what this judge said on the bench. This court held that that was not judicial misconduct. Um, in order to get out from under this case, the JTC tells this court that that judge was just using outdated gender roles. That's absolutely not what happened. That judge was not being old fashioned. And what was so critical about Hawking is that this court recognized that sometimes when we're talking about cases, we're talking about very difficult things. There's issues of violence and sex and things that are very difficult to talk about. And it is important for judges to have a little bit of freedom to be able to express their views. And that's why this court said in Hawking that it has to tolerate comments that might seem tasteless. Um, it's not a First Amendment issue. It's just the principle that sometimes it's hard to be a judge and it's hard to explain things. Um, and actually, what is so troubling about the, about the way the JTC has handled this case is it tries to take everything Judge Morrow said out of context. For example, a number of the claims come from a conversation that Judge Morrow had in his chambers with one of the prosecutors and an attorney named Bill Noakes. The issue in that case involved whether the defendant had sex with the victim and if so, how he, he did. That was the issue in the case. So when Judge Morrow is using the F word or talking about things like that, they were talking about sex because of the case. The JTC takes that entirely out of context out of context. And I think that leads to a very skewed view of this case. Um, and the, the, the JTC really consistently tries to turn the dial to make what Judge Morrow said seem different or worse than it actually was. One of the ways it does this is it says, um, Judge Morrow talked about the prosecutor's bodies. That sounds pretty bad. It sounds sexual, and that's no doubt what the JTC meant to convey. But in fact, he only asked them about their height and their weight. That's not quite the, what the JTC was repre representing. Um, I think I'm gonna try to reserve my time unless there's any questions <laughs> on the bench. Let me see, counsel. Does anyone have any additional questions at this point? Okay, you may reserve the rest of your time. Thank you. Thank you. Judge Murphy. Uh, thank you, Chief Justice. Uh, may it please the court. Uh, William B. Murphy, a 
of DICOMA appearing on behalf of the JTC. The commission unanimously recommends that this court publicly censure and suspend Judge Morrill for 12 months without pay for his misconduct. The misconduct included using inappropriate sexually graphic language to two young female assistant prosecuting attorneys on multiple occasions over a two day period during the course of a criminal trial where Judge Morrill was presiding. And then he questioned these female attorneys about their physical appearance. The details uh, are set forth in the commission a decision and recommendation, as well as the master's uh, report. Now the master, after a five day virtual hearing, found misconduct by Judge Morrill. Uh, the commission unanimously adopted the master's findings and conclusions. And in addition, the commission concluded that mis respondents mistreating of the two women as found was due to gender. The judge's actions in language constituted sexual harassment of these two female attorneys. Now, Justice Bernstein uh, had some inquiry about the sanctions and regarding the severity of the sanction recommendation. I would simply point out that this was not an isolated incident and Judge Morrow is not new to this disciplinary process. He has been admonished by the commission on more than one occasion, including an earlier admonishment that cautioned him against engaging in conversations which are of a personal or intimate nature and which may be regarded as offensive or embarrassing. Now around the same time, the state court administrator conducted his own investigation and expressed concerns about Judge Morrow's pattern of conduct and informed him that he needed to discontinue this pattern of conduct, this pattern of behavior, including refraining from initiating or participating in inappropriate conversations with staff regarding topics of a personal nature. Now, in addition to the warning and the admonishments, Judge Morrow was publicly censured by this court and suspended without pay for a 60 day period dealing with 10 counts of a complaint brought by the commission, dealing with 10 different situations. In that case, the court found that the evidence, and I'm quoting, paints a portrait of a judicial officer who is unable to separate the authority of the judicial office he holds from his personal convictions. Now the history of discipline in the current case before you illustrates that Judge Morrow is incapable or at worst unwilling to conform his judicial conduct and abide by the court rules and the canons of judicial conduct we must require of our judicial officers. The severe sanction recommended is necessary to restore and maintain the dignity and impartiality of the judiciary and protect the public. The judiciary in this state must know that the conduct, the misconduct of, by Judge Morrow against these two female attorneys cannot and will not be tolerated. Sadly, Judge Morrow has shown absolutely no remorse for what he has done. In fact, he has doubled down and claims he did nothing wrong. So far, 10 individuals, the master and the nine commissioners disagree with his judgment. He blames the victim. He blames Ms. Victor's staff and called her a liar. The master concluded otherwise, as did the commission. In view of these facts in the history, how can we expect anything else in the future? A severe sanction is called for. I would be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. I'll start with Justice Kavanaugh. Sure. Um, thank you, uh, Judge Murphy. So I'm wondering if you can help me. As you know, it's a goal of, I think, both the commission and of this court to um, try to be consistent in sanctioning 
judges, I think for the, the, for any number of very valid purposes, including, you know, providing notice to, to judges of, of the potential consequences of misconduct and, and the reliance on, on a consistent application of, of discipline. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering if you could share um, or give a little more analysis for us of what how you think that the recommended sanction of a 12 month suspension here is would be uh, consistent or treating like cases like particularly in light of the case involving Judge Iddings where for arguably more egregious conduct, he received a six month sentence or suspension, sorry. Sure. Well, Justice Kavanaugh, it's uh, a challenge for the commission uh, to try to find cases that are exactly alike so that the same recommendation can occur. But I do think the two cases that uh, the commission focused on, and by the way, the commission went through all of the Brown factors and in its report uh, and uh, recommendation, uh, I think you can see how they analyzed each of those Brown factors. But with respect to trying to compare cases, uh, the Iddings case, uh, dealt with a judge who uh, had inappropriate conduct with a staff member uh, on a number of occasions, did different things as it related to that staff member. But where it differs from this case is uh, that judge um, fully cooperated with the commission, uh, acknowledged what he did, was remorseful, and had a exemplary record, many, many years of service uh, without any complaints or uh, disciplinary actions by the commission or by your court. Judge Servas, also a different situation. Um, he uh, inappropriately uh, drew a couple pictures of physical structures of the human anatomy, uh, put them on a court file, and made an inappropriate comment to another uh, staff member about the physical appearance of an employee. Now, with respect to both of those judges, none of that occurred in a judicial uh, setting from the standpoint of participating while a trial was going on. Uh, none of it dealt with face-to-face -face, uh, communication with and putting um, the recipients in an uncomfortable position of knowing what's going on. And again, Judge Servas had an exemplary record, 37 years without any prior discipline. And this court decided under the circumstances to uh, impose a sanction of public censure. Um, I appreciate that. Can, can, I, can you expand a little bit on, and I appreciate that you're saying it's, it's but one consideration, but to me, it, it seems, tricky or problematic that a uh, respondent judge wants to maintain their innocent or, or, or that they're that what they did was not misconduct. Um, how do we sort of protect their right to be able to do that? That seems sort of foundational to our system while then not punishing, adding that as a reason to increase or impose punishment in the first place, the fact that they're just not admitting that what they did was misconduct. Well, certainly a judge has a right to do that, uh, but I think that uh, anybody reviewing the matter has to look at what occurred and determine whether or not a judge maintaining that position is a reasonable position to maintain in view of what occurs. Okay, thank you. Uh, Justice Welch. No questions, thank you. Justice Zara. Questions, thank you. Justice Viviano. <clears throat> yes, thank you. Mr. Murphy, I have a question about the commission's decision to conduct the hearing by Zoom. We, um, you know, we've held that, that a criminal uh, defendant has the right under the confrontation clause to confront his or her accusers in an in-person trial. Um, we have not yet uh, allowed for civil trials to be conducted virtually. Um, and I think almost every other proceeding that I can think of where evidence is taken, including preliminary examinations, um, 
are still conducted, the parties still have a right to have those proceedings conducted in person. And I'm just wondering, here we have a judge who the, the charges that are brought and the sanction you're seeking is a significant sanction of one year suspension, but these proceedings could also in other cases result and have resulted in judges being removed from office. Aren't you concerned that judges are sort of being treated as second class citizens when they don't have the right to defend against these charges in an in-person proceeding? Uh, Justice Viviano, I would be uh, concerned if we were in an atmosphere uh, over the last 18 months that didn't deal with a pandemic. Uh, because of the pandemic, uh, the master determined, and I think it's a discretionary call, uh, that she wanted to have the proceedings uh, by virtual, uh, in a virtual manner. This would be different if, in fact, uh, Judge Morrow and his counsel did not have a full opportunity to participate in the hearing, which they did over a five-day period, opportunity to examine and cross-examine witnesses, opportunity to present their own witnesses, could have even presented Judge Morrow if they had chosen to do so. They weren't obligated to, and they didn't. Uh, I just don't see where this process, uh, which is non-criminal, is um, and may have other implications if it's a criminal case constitutionally, but I don't see where the uh, respondent judge has been deprived of any uh, right to fully inquire and challenge uh, the complaint that has been brought by the commission. Okay, thank you. Uh, Justice Bernstein. Uh, Counsel, I, I want to follow up a little bit with uh, Justice Viviano's question. Uh, using the Zoom, I mean, it, it, this is a very, his question is a very good one. The question I have for you is, is, is that there are certain folks that are at a tremendous disadvantage because they can't use Zoom, like blind people wouldn't be able to use Zoom. So I guess my question would be is, is, is that, you know, don't you feel the significance of an individual whose reputation and career livelihood is basically on the line should require in person? Uh, Justice Bernstein, I cannot uh, dispute that uh, in person would be a preferred method if we were not dealing with the unique circumstances that have existed in the state for the last 18 months. And um, beyond that, I'm not sure that but I- But I guess my, my guess, my question back to you would be then, you know, is so ultimately, what it, is it the position of the JTC that it is the uniqueness of the circumstance that creates the disadvantage for the judge that, you know, ultimately because of the timing of the situation, he is to be put at a greater disadvantage. I'm not sure that uh, it is a great disadvantage. Um, I'm uh, fairly confident that uh, once the situation develops where we can get back to in-person proceedings, that that's what the commission will do. Right, but my question to you is then, for all the proceedings that are now taking place in this context, you know, is that, I mean, basically, how do I need to look at that? Is it just, is it more of a too bad or that's unfortunate or, you know, I mean, is this something that needs to really be significantly addressed? Well, I think you have to look at what occurred and what opportunity the respondent judge had in this virtual proceeding. And he had every uh, opportunity to question, cross-examine, present witnesses, the same as if it were in person. Uh, does it duplicate in person? I can't suggest that it does, but I don't see any disadvantage in the process, particularly in this kind of a proceeding. Council, thank you very much. Justice Clement. 
Um, just following up on um, some of Justice Kavanaugh's questions, when we're thinking about sanctions for um, this case, and then for similar cases in the future, should we be looking at the difference between whether or not there was a supervisory capacity um, versus what took place here where it's um, you know a member of the bar, um, like an assistant prosecutor or a member of the public? Um, and then should we be considering whether it took place during a judicial hearing or outside of that setting? Just trying to see how much weight we should be giving to those when we're, when we're looking at uh, prior sanctions and then in this current case and then, and then thinking of, of situations in the future. Well, Justice Clement, this occurred over a two day period while a trial was going on that this judge was presiding over and these two young female uh, assistant prosecuting attorneys were part of that process. Uh, part of it occurred in the courtroom. Now, granted, not while the judge was on the bench, but the judge came down from the bench, sat next to the table, uh, and had the conversation that is part of our report. Uh, the second issue was with uh, one of the assistant prosecutors that he invited into chambers with the opposing counsel, and that's where that took place. So I think it's clear that that type of thing in this case occurred in the, in, in the court, in the courtroom. And it came out into the courtroom following that in-chamber meeting uh, and started to ask the uh, two uh, female assistant prosecutors about their height, weight, et cetera. Um, so I, I think that we're, we're in the uh, realm of a courtroom, unlike Judge Eddings, that uh, you know, he was not uh, dealing with a trial situation. He's not dealing with attorneys appearing in front of him. This would apply, uh, frankly, uh, I think anybody that was in that courtroom that had to deal with what the judge did here. It happens to have been two female prosecutors, but if it had been a witness that he had this discussion with, that it had been uh, anyone else that came into that courtroom, I think you deal with the same kind of uh, uh, approach and the same kind of consideration. So do we give um, greater weight if it's happening in, and, and I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm understanding what you're saying, you know, whether it happened in chambers or, or at the table that it was part of, um, you know, the, the judicial proceeding. It wasn't, you know, at a lunch. It wasn't, you know, at some outside of, event. Um, do we give greater weight because it's, in that type of forum than um, in the case of, of Judge Eddings where it took place over you know, several years, um, but was behind closed doors. And, and, um, and then the other part of that was, you know, is there anything to be thought of, of, of if you have a supervisory um, capacity over an individual that is making the complaint versus it being someone um, you know, similarly situated to the assistant prosecutors in this situation? If I understand your question, I, I think that uh, it's appropriate to give greater weight to something that occurs within the courtroom, within the process of a court proceeding. Um, you know, when you try to compare the cases, again, Eddings, Servas to this, uh, it's just not limited to uh, the act itself, the conduct itself, the misconduct itself. Uh, I think you have to look at the entire picture, including the history uh, of the judge, uh, what they'd been disciplined for or not before, uh, whether they're remorseful. I think all those things are appropriate considerations. And those are the kind of things that separate uh, Judge Morrow in this case, in my opinion, from that of Judge, uh, Gidding, or Judge Eddings or uh, Judge Servas. Thank you, Judge Murphy. Um, Judge Murphy, let me ask one question. The, the, the JTC and the master didn't make a finding that um, Judge Morrow sexually harassed anyone. And I assume they did not because there was lacking, you know, proof lacking. So that makes me um, wonder about the comparison to Iddings. Can you address that? Well, I, I think that the commission did find that um, Judge Morrow uh, 
because of gender, uh, treated the two female prosecutors uh, in a disrespectful and discourteous way. Well, that's possible that, and, and different from sexual harassment, right? Not in my mind. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, I have used up all your time. Do you wanna close uh, briefly or? I, I think I've presented a pretty complete picture here. There have been some good questions, obviously, by the justices. Uh, I, I think at the end of the day, um, we're dealing with a power situation here, a power of the position, a power of the robe, and abuse of that power. And because of that, I think a substantial and se severe sanction is appropriate as the commission has recommended. I think public censure is appropriate. And again, suspension for 12 months without pay is the recommendation of the commission. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Collier, you have some time. Thank you. I want to just address a few points that came up uh, on the on the issue of of the, of the Zoom hearing and whether it was appropriate to hold a virtual hearing. This court has a rule that says a master must pick a time and a place to hold a hearing. That rule was not sus suspended during the pandemic. It applied here. There is no definition of the word place that would accommodate Zoom. And that's so clear that the JTC's argument to this court in its brief is that the word place could mean not an actual spot, but space in, in general. So if the argument is that the court rule allows a master to hold a hearing in space in general, we've gotten pretty far from what the court rule actually says. And anytime the argument is that it's too hard to follow the rules or it's not convenient to follow the rules. Those are red flags. And it Council, was possible. Council, I have a question. Maybe it's because I'm a former trial judge, but I think that uh, it's really important in our justice system that credibility determinations are made in person by the fact finder so that they can observe the demeanor and body language, et cetera of the witness while testifying uh, under stress, right, under cross-examination. That's why appellate courts typically defer to the fact finding uh, um, of the lower courts or, or of a jury. Um, my question for you is, uh, was your client um, harmed by this in light of what appears to be, in this case, that the relevant facts are almost all undisputed. Yes, my client was harmed. Um, there's there's a couple ways he was harmed. One is when you have an evidentiary hearing over Zoom, the finder of fact can't see a tapping foot or drumming fingers, or if someone's being coached from off screen. All of those tools are taken away in a Zoom hearing. And it's important in this case because there is an issue about credibility. Judge Morrow, from the very start, said, I said what I said. He, he acknowledged everything that he said. But the JTC keeps trying to make this case about sexual harassment rather than his, his words. And that, and that required the fact finder to assess the credibility of one of the young prosecutors. It was this prosecutor who falsely claimed that Judge Morrow was hitting on her. And we know that she did not tell the truth because when she was under oath, she said he did not hit on her. And it really is shocking that the JTC would argue that Judge Morrow's discipline should be increased because he objected to being lied about in this fashion. It really is troubling and I think it should trouble this this court. I, I don't know if that answered your question, Justice Viviano, but uh, it, did, it did. I appreciate your answer and and, uh, and and your last point, I agree that we should be concerned uh, about the idea that a judge should be punished more when they acknowledge the facts, but then 
um, argue about what what conclusions should be drawn from those facts in a way that defends their position. I don't I don't really know how a judge could defend him or herself if they're not given that opportunity um, to defend themselves once the facts have been determined. Um, just real briefly, the other issue is um, J the JTC's counsel brought out the fact that the JTC found an issue of gender discrimination here and the master did not. It's important to note the way the JTC has kind of twisted the facts to support that claim. It argues that when Judge Morrow was in his chambers talking to Ashley Chiffon and to Bill Noakes, he was only talking to Ashley Chiffon. That's a bit like saying that I'm having an ex parte conversation with the court because I'm the one who's talking. But the JTC's counsel is here too. He's involved in this process and Bill Noakes was present and he was involved in that process. Let me end just one more thing that really troubled me about the JTC's brief. The JTC told this court that these cons the constitutional issues that we raised are, in its words, a meritless sideshow. The Constitution is never a sideshow. And it is critical for the court to ensure that we achieve justice through a just process. And a process in which the JTC issues a complaint and then acts as a judge over its own claims is neither just nor in compliance with the due process clause. I have nothing further, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Collier. And thank you, Judge Murphy, the case will be submitted. Thank you.